we start, on the basis of no such thing as a free lunch, a little, bit, little walk around the room. Who thinks they're a project manager? Show of hands, please. You can cover your eyes if you want to be. Project director type level. Interesting. You used to be, I know. <laughs> yeah. So what does everybody else think? Could share out some ideas of what you do. Just, I'm just trying to gauge audience, that's all. Because nobody else ever does this. <laughs> Regional manager, that's what I am. So it's a sort of project director type level? Yeah. I guess it could be counted as that. Yeah. Anybody else? Curators? Victim. Victim. <laughs> <laughs> Specialist. Yeah. Okay, it's just... That's I'm fairly... I'm just an archaeologist. Just, just a humble. Yeah, I'm an archaeologist. That's just... That was quite interesting. Steve Haynes, Arup, there's my lists of what I've used, project management qualifications, chartered environmentalist as well, thank you sir, mm -hmm. member of the environmental sciences, done the whole thing, been there, got my tickets in project management, it's page down isn't it on this one, I'm going to have a quick run through from <coughs> my perspective and experience in, from the perspective of a project, looking at some of these issues, picking up with Mike's ideas, picking up other things that I've worked with others here that I can see have experienced so some feedback would be useful guys and just sort of getting an understanding just to give you an idea of how this fits with what I've done I've done project, project designs developed procurement strategies for clients either on very small developments or very huge developments both within the UK and abroad which was quite entertaining archaeology why do you want to do that surely we can just lift it up and put it to one side for you we can give it a go boys but Tender compilation and assessment, that's important, really, to understand how you're going to pull this tender together. What does the client really want? Management of archaeological suppliers, commercial <coughs> management, program management, that's also program in the sense of the Gantt chart, we're all familiar with, aren't we? But also when you have 30 sites all connected under one job, it's managing the program, in other words, the program of pieces of work. That adds another bundle of joy into the whole commercial management sector of trying to have multiple contractors or suppliers, as I prefer to call them working together to the same standards all at the same time and of course the whole world of risk management which is poorly understood and delivered in archaeology and really needs a lot of work putting into it and I won't bore you with that today but I can for a reasonable fee. <laughs> so what are the headlines? We work in a project environment, the key things are intrinsically uncertain in terms of inputs, in other words how much time what are we really producing? We can say we're going to produce an evaluation report. At the beginning of a piece of work, we don't really know what the shape and size of that is, other than the usual parameters of content and what have you. When it gets to major pieces of work, that uncertainty grows hugely, and then that incurs risk all the way along. So that gives us uncertainty in terms of program and pricing and costs exclamation mark you know how are we going to price this how are we going to look and envisage these projects when we get them low profit margins on projects that's bad two to three percent tim six still think that's pretty poor let's look at 10 plus i mean we're in a commercial world here that's where i'm coming from 10 plus is not unreasonable we've got to pay ourselves feed our family we've got to pay back to the business to build the business build capacity in with investment Let's have nice, proper offices. Let's pay people proper salaries, with all due respect to all of you. And, you know, get the money rolling. Let's start thinking about those issues. How can we protect ourselves in terms of the project environment? We don't want huge losses. I mean, the question is, why are we making such poor returns on our projects? Is it because we make lots of bad decisions? We have lots of big losses? Or are we intrinsically cutting each other's throats so much that the base has dropped there. I don't know, I'm just posing the questions. I, I see a lot of tenders coming in. I can give you some answers. Let's look at, let's start at the beginning, looking at the client's procurement. <coughs> the way clients procure their, the services that we all undertake is driven by a number of factors. The client that you may see, it may not be the client at all, the end backstop client. You may be working for an architect who's working for a cost engineer who's working for a design firm who's working for the, the client, or the client could be government, which you never see. And I don't know how many of you are going to pop down to um, the palace and ask 
Her Majesty, <laughs> next time there's an archaeological project goes bad in the highways agency scheme, that one for you. So that determines the tender documentation they send out, the terms of engagement, the contracts that Tim touched on, the NEC suite does provide a very good, and as my preferred personally, uh, means of engagement, and the way they control the projects. Little tiny projects, they may say, go away, do it, big projects, let's use the HS2 as an analogy, there will be sheaves of paperwork on that one, as there were on other major projects. <coughs> That gives you a flavour. Nothing is simple, nothing is straightforward. It's all determined by how the client pushes down on the contractor and how far that contractor is down the stream. What in effect you can have is the client's requirements, the next level's requirements, coming down the sort of ladder. And you can end up with this pile of requirements, some of which are directly related to the client that you're working to, but others may be a requirement <laughs> from right up the top of the tree. Take um, insurances. Your local client may want a million quid, but the client, because that's the insurance um, criteria they require, they may, may, may require public indemnity up to five, ten million. That's not your client's fault, that's a function of the way the structure of the procurement cycle works. You, know, you have to understand these nuances, it's, it's, it's sometimes not very clear. You may not ever meet the, the client. Although sometimes they can be quite entertaining when you have one where it turns up, who turns up in a Bentley and looks like something has just come off the convoy. He doesn't care. He says, I'm the client. I'll do what I like. It's fun. Uh, let's look at a very not unusual <coughs> procurement cycle for a very simple job. You know, we've all been here. Little ITT comes in. Give us a lump sum. Simple job. A few trial trenches, a bit of reporting. We all know what it's like. Simple price and outline. Quick tender evaluation of all done. Everybody's happy, except it wasn't a simple one. It's a lump sum, remember, so you can't vary the terms, but he can. He can play with it and modify it. You take longer to do it, you end up in loss. Let's just sit, sit with that model just for the moment. <coughs> there are opinions on that. That's all very well in a very simple and truncated environment. As a friend of mine recently said, perhaps the um, best way to look at it is that that sort of very simple model is all right if you're given a pot, uh, ceramic specialist. Must call them pottery specialists. I keep getting told off on that. Ceramic specialist, five shares of pottery. We know what they are. They can give you a price for that. You give them 50 bags of pottery that haven't been looked at for 30 years. They're sat in the corner in the dark. Nobody knows quite what they are. But ask them for the same lump sum approach. They, they won't do it. So why are we buying that at the macro level? It's, it just beggars belief in sometimes. As I said, when you have a simple, if you just get a return on tenders, six prices, 30 grand, 20 grand, five, 10, whatever, how can you make a realistic comparison? You've got no documentation to support that, say, method statements, safety plans, or more importantly, you've got no build up, and I'm gonna look at this from a commercial perspective very strongly how that price is built up. You've no understanding of what people have allowed for, what they haven't allowed for. How, how they're allowed for risk. You know, is the price risk loaded or have they assumed, as is often the case, that things can be extras and you can keep adding the cost and keep racking it up. If you're looking for, from a client's perspective, you're looking for not necessarily cost certainty, but to understand the parameters, the top and the bottom of price. You may take a tender evaluation and then extend that and do things with it. I'll come to that later. Which comes to the issue of how you're going to value changes. When a project changes, you price for 10 trenches and it's 30 trenches, that's not a problem. You have a unit measure to, to, to remeasure that and agree that. It's, it, change is adaptive and can be used. Just to give you a little feel of tender comparisons and protect the innocent and defend the guilty. A little chart on the bottom here looks at a half dozen tenders over a number of years for different types of works, taking the average of the sum of those, and you can see the variance around the average, and it's huge, plus nearly 160%, minus 80 off the average, just to give you an idea of the, when tenders come in, and it's something everybody needs to consider, is why are you pricing as you are, are you actually including everything? Because 
this is based on the normalised tenders at the end. Once we're getting people's prices and driving the tenders to understand what they've actually priced for. It's important to a client that when they get the tender, they can actually understand what you've tendered for against the scope of works that you've sent. If the scope of works is ambiguous, or the thing's missing, then it's, you're obligated, quite frankly, to your organisation to challenge that tender. You say this, do you mean that? This is missing, we're going to allow for this. Simply to put in a price and say, well, that's it, you said you want that, that's what you're buying, it's just not good enough. You've got to challenge these things, you've got to stretch them and make them really work. Because the client, there are certain sectors of clients who will just roll you over, get the bigger ones and they'll work with you and they'll give you a hard time during the tender evaluation because they want to understand what you've priced for, and what you haven't priced for. Make it work. It's all too easy to allow the client to roll you, roll you <coughs> along rather than it being a cooperative <coughs> undertaking, which is what the NEC Suites is all about, is joint working, understanding how to work together. <coughs> And I've only got a few slides because I'm going to do a very quick run through. <coughs> Simple pricing mechanisms are fine as we go back to my sacks of ceramics, where we've got well defined, simple activities. We understand what they are. You can easily achieve those within a defined and understandable scope, process, and output. With nominal or low risk, and they're short in duration. So short, we say two, three weeks. You can understand it. It's almost, for want of a better term, you can hold it all in your head. You can understand it. It's easy. You can just go away and do it. Where you get this situation, which is fits with archaeology and GI work particularly, is a good example. Poorly defined. How many trenches do you really want? What's in the ground? What's the output? What's the quantities? That then leads to medium to high risk, massive potential for change. Again, driving this uncertainty of conditions and outcomes. The bigger the project, the more numbers of interventions you're doing, the more these drive. Multiple phases and long term. The longer something is, the more phases of work you've got, the more uncertainty you're getting, the more chance of making huge and substantial losses on jobs. If you're into, into these fixed price, fixed terms in engagement, it's just... I don't know anybody who would do that from any other discipline within the engineering type environment. They just you wouldn't go there unless it was so heavily loaded that you'd allow for contingencies that the, the real price was a pound and you ended up charging thirty or something ridiculous like that. He says being discreet. <laughs> so what I'm advocating is at the base, once you've got your scope sorted out, it's a price list, bill of quantities, whatever you want to call it. Within that you have lump, if you like, fixed unit costs, say a report, go away and review the existing reports, you've been given those as part of the tender, you know what you're doing, you know exactly what you're dealing with, you can fix price that. But I'm just picking numbers randomly, I sat last night and just picked things out randomly just to give you an idea of how one would look in a mini version. Some C14 high precision, the quantity you is estimated for the purpose of pricing is 10, you get a price, if it's 15 it goes up accordingly, if it's five it comes down accordingly. You're paying and doing, or rather you're getting paid for the work you do. Not having to stab blindly in the dark and make some estimation of something you can't estimate because you don't know what the quantum is. <coughs> and it works through, so you end up with a, if you like, a starting price. That's your baseline price based on that scope of works to undertake. As soon as you change that, the prices change accordingly. They can go up, they can come down. They should include all your profit overheads, all your add-ons into that. I've done ones in the past where I've allowed risk items, which detail those out, so that if they happen, we are, both sides understand what they are. That then goes into the programme. This sort of approach allows for the inherent lack of clarity in archaeology, both in the field and the post x phase. How often do we see specialists asking for a bit more, <coughs> There's no, I'm not offending anybody, but it allows for that push and degree of uncertainty and definition that really needs to be in there. Some of you may say, well, how does the client know really what the outturn cost is going to be? 
that is the client's responsibility with their consultants, Tim, come on, stand up, to define and help them understand that cost. I spend a lot of time with clients working costs, backs and forwards, up and down, different parameters, what <coughs> could be the rate of inflation for the next five years. It's an art, of, it's an art, an art and a science all at the same time. Invariably, I haven't been wrong yet. Been bloody close. <laughs> but there's, we have enough historical data to build up those models. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, the price is, is a model. It tells you what you're going to be paid on that assumption, on that quantum of work. If it changes, as I said, you get paid more or less. So, what does this all look like? You should be thinking of and producing, and I know some of you do, I've worked with some of you before, major projects and other projects, and we developed this, but I do see, across the profession, a real lack and ability to engage with all those heavy duty, if you like, because some people like to think of it, ways of controlling the project. It is the project managers, in my opinion, role to control the project in all of its sense in its technical sense its commercial program the whole round in in the round within the scope as we've got here so we've got all these items at the core of it the price list with program cost planning resource planning risk allocation budgeting and that all sits within the c of the scope as that scope changes grows shrinks all of those elements come together and define the project on top of that, that obviously links to your terms of engagement and commercial management of that. Oh, I'll leave that for a minute. It's important to understand that it's not only the project manager's responsibility to manage the project, it's also the project manager's responsibility to communicate that to his entire project team. We mentioned this briefly and going on to the benefits as I've already gone there. <coughs> to understand gender, that is the most important thing. Engender a common understanding both from between the client, the contractor, the client's team, and the contractor's team. It's all very well the project manager knowing you've got X million pounds in the budget, but he's got a stream that one that group's got five, ten, fifteen, twenty, forty thousand. There's all too much of this, and I see this in archaeology a lot. Wow, we just want a million pounder. Well, so what? Your budget's actually 5,000 quid. It, it's great for the organisation, but you've got to look at it at the, at the, at the um, task level as well. It's all too easy to get excited about the big number, not the definition of what's required. I see it in Arab as well. We just want that. Ex and then everybody runs away and then starts thinking about it in panics. But anyway, that's another story altogether. Some closing thoughts. How do you procure your services when you're buying archaeological services, pottery specialists and the like? Have you got a proper procurement system, project managers out there? Standardised, regularised, control costs, good man over there. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a thought, and it's a real thought. I've had subcontractors to contractors coming to me on the quiet, completely outrageously, complaining about their client. I understand your problems. I will do what I can, but at the end of the day, I'm not your client. They're your client. You're a supplier to them. Don't re reinvent the wheel. There is so much information <coughs> and details and examples out there. Use them, bespoke them, pull them together as much, as I say, with a lot of the project management stuff. It's all out there. Just read it, learn it, play with it, deploy it. It does require a lot of thought and consideration by the client of what level and level of detail and applicability they want to apply to the contract and apply to their control mechanism for delivery. It involves, I think, bobble agreements, a lot of investment from the supplier to develop these things, to get proper developed systems together on big projects. They do require a lot of input. Manage the costs, the bottom line. Look at the individual breakdowns how your budgets are built up and manage at that level because then the bottom line will look after itself. If you start looking after the bottom line first, 
you lose sight of the individual cost elements. That's fatal. Understand the commercial anatomy of your projects. Do some analytics and look at the way po previous projects have performed and be built up, where you've lost money, where you've made money, where things could have gone better, which sits with critical review of process. And finally, in the last two, price the job. What do you think it's going to cost when you're bidding? And then think again about what it may take to win. Do not constantly go in at city prices because that's what we've always done. It's always been five grand for that. It's always been 20 grand for that. If you lose a few, it's better to lose a few and not make, take the losses. And that's as simple <coughs> as that. Because constant losses, you may employ less people, but you'll make more money at the end of the day. And finally, and I will close on this, understand your clients. What drives them? What do they really want? They may not want least cost. They, want, they may want program surety or quality of delivery. I have in the past, through tenders, I don't always appoint the least cost. I appoint that. As Tim said, those are, that are most appropriate to deliver the job. And it really is as simple as that. And with that, I think I'm on programme. Excellent, thank you. <laughs>